Hi friends and welcome to lecture seven about minerals. It's important to talk about minerals because, let me get a pen here, because the earth is made of rocks. Okay, and rocks are made of minerals. So really, at their most fundamental, the earth is made of minerals. Now minerals, in turn, are made of elements that are bonded together to form crystalline compounds. So in today's lecture, we are going to be discussing minerals and to some extent, the elements that comprise them and how they're joined together or bonded to make the most common rock forming minerals on earth. This lecture will be followed by another lecture that's all about the properties, the different physical properties of minerals. All right, so let's dive in. For geologists, minerals have a very specific definition. So try to erase whatever you've heard about minerals from kind of the common lexicon or maybe from like nutrition speak. Um, to geologists, minerals mean something very specific. For us, minerals uh, must meet five um, uh, part, the definition of a mineral has five parts. All minerals have to be naturally occurring. Okay, so the earth has to make it. They have to be inorganic. They have to be crystalline. They have to be solid. And they have to be formed by geologic processes with a definite chemical composition. Okay, so those five things that I've underlined are the five criteria that define what geologists consider to be minerals. We're going to discuss them one by one. Okay, first, minerals must be naturally occurring. That means the planet Earth has to make them. On the left, we've got the mineral zircon, one of my personal favorites. On the right, we've got a cubic zirconia. Cubic zirconia, this is fake diamond and they are manufactured in laboratories. Okay, so um, cubic zirconia are a um, solid with the formula ZRO2 um, is not naturally made by the earth, at least not in, in that um, structure. So cubic zirconia, not a mineral, zircon, a mineral. Minerals must be solid. Okay, this is the easiest part of the definition. A solid is a state of matter that can maintain its shape indefinitely. So liquids, gases, those are never considered minerals. Minerals must be solid. And by the way, here's a picture of one of the Earth's most beautiful minerals called kyanite. Kyanite is a rare mineral that is distinguishable, distinguishable by its color. It's almost always this um, beautiful blue color. Minerals must be crystalline. Okay, this is a tough one to explain. Um, a solid that is crystalline has an ordered atomic arrangement. That means that it's completely predictable where in the uh, internal structure of that mineral where you might find a given element because they are uh, regularly predictably ordered in the structure. Um, the bottom picture here shows a solid that is non-crystalline. So there's no atomic order to the elements that make up that solid. So all the green balls are kind of randomly distributed and then locked into place in the solid structure. So glass, um, all glasses, uh, whether they be made by planet Earth in volcanic systems or whether they're blown in a glass making laboratory somewhere, all glasses are quenched very rapidly from a melt and therefore they do not have the opportunity to form these ordered atomic arrangements, so they are not crystalline. Here's a kind of trippy example of how geologists sometimes render um, mineral structures. So this is called a polyhedral view of a mineral. Um, and in this case, what we're trying to represent are the locations of different elements in the mineral structure. So some of those are shown as these little balls here, like the blue and the tan colored ones. And then some are shown as these polyhedral elements that are um, kind of different shades of yellow. Um, but what's important here is that you can represent even the most complex mineral structures um, as crystalline solids. So it might be a complex solid, but every blue ball or tan ball or element that's represented in the yellow triangle has a specific 
orderly, repetitive place in the internal structure of the mineral. So this is representative of a crystalline structure. We know that for every one of these blue balls, let's say that's iron, there must be, I don't know, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 of these tan balls or whatever. Um, so we know the relative proportion. Let's say that we know that these things are calcium or I'm just making up elements here. And let's say that these contain the element silicon. Okay, so we know that they're what elements are present in the mineral and what they what their proportions are relative to one another that's all a mineral minerals must have a definite chemical composition that means that we must be able to easily define the chemistry of a given mineral and that follows from the requirement that minerals be crystalline so we know that um, let me go back a slide the formula is in this very simple case we've got the mineral fluorite Fluorite is made of one atom of calcium bonded to two atoms of fluorine in a regular repetitive structure. Therefore, we can write a chemical composition for the mineral fluorite like so, CAF2. And that tells us that there are two atoms of fluorine per every one atom of calcium in the fluorite structure. And we know, because it's crystalline, where in that atomic arrangement we can expect to find the tennis ball looking calcium and the little golf ball looking fluorite crystals. Minerals have a very specific arrangement of atoms in very specific positions within a crystal lattice. Um, and that's what allows them to have crystalline structures and to have definite chemical formulae. So we can write a formula like CAF2 for any mineral out there. So you'll remember zircon is ZrSiO4, quartz is SiO2. We could do this for every single mineral that has been identified. If you tried to write a formula for that non-crystalline glass, you would not be able to um, because uh, it's totally unpredictable what would be in that structure because all of the different um, green balls that we're representing elements are just arranged willy-nilly in the structure. You don't know what's where and how many there are. So you can't write a definite chemical composition for something that is non-crystalline. Okay, minerals are usually inorganic. There is one slight a tweak to this rule, and that is that some uh, critters, mainly marine organisms, actually secrete inorganic mineral material. Um, usually it's calcite. So in this case, we've got a blue mussel, um, and it's making aragonite, which is similar to calcite, a biogenic mineral. Most minerals form via crystallization from a melt or a magma or from precipitation from a solution. Think of um, salt crystallizing out of a glass of water on your nightstand. Um, some might form via chemical reactions within a metamorphic rock, so that can happen too. And then occasionally we have what we consider biogenic minerals. So that's a special case of a mineral that is formed via secretion by a living organism. However, I want you to uh, recognize that um, minerals cannot be organic. And we define, chemis chemists define anything that's organic as having carbon and hydrogen bonded together in the structure of that compound. So you will never find a mineral that has carbon and hydrogen bonded together. That would make it organic. What I'd like you to do um, is think about the compounds that I'm showing on this picture. I've included sugar and its chemical composition, ice and its chemical composition, mercury and its chemical composition, and coal. I don't have a composition for that, but I want you to think about these four compounds, and I want you to ask yourself, 
do they meet the definition of mineral as I've just described it? Once you've given that some thought, I would like you to go on to Canvas and take the quiz that I've posted there. It's an ungraded practice quiz, so doesn't matter how you know well you do on it. I've written some feedback into the question, so um, take it for fun. See how you do. See if you got these right. Um, again, totally not graded, won't affect your grade in the course, but go take the quiz, have a look at it. When we meet together live on Thursday, we'll discuss the answers that you input. Here are some other questions to think about that we'll return to on Thursday. Um, I'm telling you here that glass is not a mineral, but what I want to know is why not? Um, so think about these options here, and we'll discuss these on Thursday as well. And I have one more for you, and that is of these things that are listed here, salt, concrete, quartz, gold, and diamond, which of those, there's only one, is not a mineral? So see if you can spot the one that's not a mineral, and we'll discuss that on Thursday as well. Okay, food for thought. A crystal is a form of a mineral that grows from a continuous piece of solid that is typically bounded by flat faces. And those faces grow naturally as the minerals form. And typically those faces reflect the uh, internal atomic structure. So these are tiny crystals of the gem variety of beryl. Um, you might recognize it as being aquamarine. And you can see that these form very beautiful six-sided prisms. So there's kind of the end view of one, and then here would be one of these crystal faces. Here would be another over here. So these aquamarine crystals were allowed to grow and to develop into their perfect crystal forms, and they have very distinctive shapes. Other minerals, because of their chemical compositions, will take on different forms. So halite, for example, will always form a cube, like you're seeing here. Um, quartz will always form a prism-like shape um, if allowed to grow and develop its perfect form. Uh, calcite will always form a rhombohedrus, like you're seeing here. Um, or a rhombus, excuse me. The external shape of a euhedral crystal, euhedral, what is that word? Is a diagnostic physical property that is controlled by the arrangement of atoms. So it's not random that quartz always forms a prism, halide always forms a cube, etc. It has everything to do with how, for example, Na and Cl are bonded together within the halite structure, or Si and O are bonded together in the quartz structure. Euhedral is a term that means a mineral that has developed its perfect crystal form. So not all minerals get to develop into euhedral crystals. Some of them run out of space or they run out of the elements they need to keep developing. And so they might look kind of, um, they might not develop these really characteristic shapes that you're seeing here. Let's go back to the halite example. Halite is a very simple mineral. It only has two elements, and we can write its formula like so, NaCl, and that's because for every one atom of sodium, there is one atom of chlorine, and these alternate with one another to form perfect little cubes. And so on the left, we've got kind of the gumball atomic scale model of halite. And on the right, what you're looking at is a microscope image of halite crystals. And these are forming perfect little cubes. You can see the little cubes here. And of course, you've seen macroscopic images of halite. If you've ever sprinkled salt onto your food, um, you have seen um, little baby cubes of halite. That's what you're putting on your food for the most part. So we know that minerals are compound compounds. They're made of elements and molecules that are bonded together in regular and repetitive ways. We know this part because minerals have to be crystalline and because they have to have definite chemical compositions. Compounds can be broken down into their elements. 
So remember at the beginning of this lecture, I told you that the earth is made of rocks, rocks are made of minerals, and minerals are basically compounds of elements. Elements are pure chemical substances that cannot be further broken down. So let's take a quick detour into the land of elemental chemistry. All the universe is made of elements, and an atom is simply the smallest unit of an element that maintains that element's properties. So here's a view of the periodic table. Um, these are all of the universe's elements arranged by their the number of protons that they have in their nuclei, and then grouped according to similar chemical behavior. Let's zoom in and look at one element, the element oxygen. Oxygen has the atomic number eight, and what that means is that by definition, oxygen has to have eight protons in its nucleus. I'm abbreviating protons P plus because um, protons are positively charged. Notice, however, that the atomic weight of oxygen is roughly 16. Okay, and that's because in addition to the eight protons in the nucleus of oxygen, there are also some number of neutrons. They're called neutrons because they're neutral. They are not positive nor negatively charged. So the gray balls here in the nucleus of this atom of oxygen are neutrons, and the purple pluses are protons. And in this case, um, this oxygen atom would be considered an isotope of oxygen 16. An isotope is simply a variant of an element that has um, a certain number of neutrons in it. So in this case, eight, eight protons plus eight neutrons equals um, an atomic weight of 16, and so this is oxygen 16. The um, kind of hazy red thing out here is the electron cloud. And in an uncharged um, atom of oxygen, the electron cloud would contain eight electrons. So one each to balance the eight positive protons in the nucleus. Okay, so that's what's shown here. Again, in the nucleus of an oxygen-16 isotope, you would have eight protons and eight neutrons. Therefore, this atom would have an atomic weight of 16. To balance those eight protons, you've got to have eight electrons in the outer electron shells. Um, however, uh, as you know, um, many atoms out there are not uncharged. They have some kind of um, electric charge, and that's what causes them to form bonds with other atoms on the periodic table. If we look at the example of neon, which is shown in the bottom right here, you can see that neon has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight electrons in its outermost electron shell. That makes its outermost electron shell full, and it likes that. If, it, if an atom has an outer electron shell that's completely full, it is not um, it is considered stable and will not form bonds with other elements. Therefore, neon is always a gas and is never found in chemical formula. If we look at the oxygen case, however, in the outermost electron shell, it only has one, two, three, four, five, six electrons. Therefore, it has room for two more. It wants another one here and another one there. It wants to be like neon if it can be. So it is short two, and oxygen will do everything in its power to attract two more electrons to its outermost electron shell because it wants to be stable like its nearest noble gas neighbor, neon. For that reason, atoms tend to either give up, get, or share electrons such that they can uh, develop an outermost electron shell that is complete. And when that happens, atoms become charged. And when an atom becomes charged, we call it an ion. An ion with a positive charge is considered a cation, and an ion with a negative charge is considered an anion. So in the example that I'm showing here, sodium has one electron that's just hanging out in its outermost electron shell. 
it wants to be stable, so the easiest way for it to be stable is to kick that electron out. When it does that, its outermost electron shell is then this one here, which does have the full complement of eight electrons. So sodium is stable if it can get rid of that one in the outermost electron shell. And now let's look at chlorine. It's got the opposite case. It's got two, four, six, seven. Oh man, it desperately needs one more electron. What if it were to get this electron from sodium? If that happened, then chlorine would gain an electron and become stable, and sodium would lose an electron and become stable. If you lose a negatively charged particle, then you become a cation because your net, um, your net charge is now positive. And the opposite true is true if you gain a negatively charged particle. If you gain an electron, then you be, develop a net negative charge. Okay, so when this happens, when that electron transfer occurs, both elements fill their outermost electron shells so they become stable. They also turn into ions, sodium into a cation and chlorine into an anion. And that exchange of electrons me, forms a bond. Okay, and that bond is considered an ionic bond because they have shared electrons and, or excuse me, they have exchanged electrons, developed um, opposite charges, and they are now held together by the attraction of their opposite charges. So NaCl, or the mineral halite, also known as um, table salt, is an ionic compound. Electrons, um, electrons can also be shared with neighboring atoms, and when that happens, covalent bonding occurs, and covalent bonds are very, very strong. So in this case, we've got a carbon atom that only had one, two, three, four electrons in its outermost shell. So in order to get to eight, what it does is it gets um, next to four other carbon atoms, one, two, three, four, and their electron uh, spheres overlap with one another such that they can each share electrons, the red circled electrons, with one another. And it's not just this central carbon, it's every carbon atom in the structure does that. And what do you get when you have a mineral that's made entirely of carbon covalently sharing electrons like this? You get the strongest mineral in the world, diamond. There is nothing stronger on earth than a diamond. Um, and that's because of the covalent bonding of carbons in the crystal lattice. So the hardest mineral on earth. Um, what's interesting perhaps is that carbon has something called a polymorph um, that is graphite. And graphite is the softest mineral on earth. So now we've got two minerals with the same chemical composition we can write the chemi chemical formula for diamond and graphite as simply C. They are made of the element carbon. Um, but in one case, that carbon is covalently bonded throughout the structure and is the hardest mineral on earth. And in the other case, the carbon is covalently bonded together, but only in these sheets. So you can see the sheets here have strong bonds, but then the sheets are bonded to one another through incredibly weak bonds, which we won't really discuss in this class. Therefore, graphite and carbon are con uh, sorry, graphite and diamond are considered polymorphs, and a polymorph is just a mineral that has the same composition. So again, in this case, just the um, element carbon, but a different atomic structure. Okay, I'm going to leave it there uh, with this definition of polymorphs, and I will see you guys for the next video lecture. Don't forget to go to Canvas and take that quiz.